Yep, that's what it says. Are we live? <laughs> that's what it says. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, well, there we are. Hey, Dr. Mitch, how are you? I am good. How are you, Kimberly? I'm good. I know it's Wednesday now, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, like we were talking off, off air here, it's like, I have no idea what day it is. I know my name. I got that. Yep. Everything else is up for grabs, I think. <clears throat> <laughs> well, I know your name too, and I know mine, so we're good. <laughs> thanks for yeah. thanks for talking with me today. I know things are a little sure. nuts, um, but yeah, I had contacted you the other day, talking to you about grief because I've had a few friends mm -hmm. reaching out that are just um, extra struggling right now, and they yeah. don't know why. They're like, "Why does my grief feel so much worse?" And I know there's so much else that we can talk about in grieving, grieving friends, grieving jobs, loss of our time. But um, what are your thoughts? Just why does it feel so much worse right now? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think um, uh, I, our, there's a lot that we don't pay attention to, I think, in our everyday lives. And, and that tends to structure our days. And um, most of the time when we use the word grief, we always connect it to, to losing a person, you know, to death or a lost relationship but but when we're talking about more ambiguous things like a future or a future event i mean i we we have all these students that have all lost their graduation ceremony and it's not it's not a matter of spectating on it because that's essentially what they're doing is they're spectating like a, a sports event rather than actually participating in it and so i you know, I, I think what it does is it, it, in this, the social isolation and the quarantining and all the other things tends to highlight the things that we take for granted. And then we have to come around to, ouch, that hurts. I, I'm not real sure what to do with this, these feelings. And, and like I said, we reserve grief and that word for big things. <clears throat> but what I think we're finding out is that actually the landscape of grief in between the big peaks, the really big items is filled in with these little things. And when we lose those, then we, we see, all right, my life starts getting flatter <laughs> because there's no land in between these big peaks of grief or whatever. And so I, I, I think that's, there's an opportunity. Let me put it this way. There's an opportunity, I think, and I use that reservedly. Because usually when we talk about an opportunity, usually we're talking about something good. <laughs> and I don't think anybody is going to disagree with me to say that this is not, this is not good. <clears throat> At the same time, I think there is an opportunity to revisit the conversation around grief and loss and, and it being connected to not just the big things, but things in our lives that we experience all the time. And I think that's one of them. I, I had one student tell me it. And I kind of summarize it by saying it's the little things that really hurt because they don't ever, they don't go away. They're always there. I mean, we can usually confine a loss to a certain period of time, but the little things they're, they're always missing. And, and how do I respond to something that's missing? And that's where the problem I think comes in is we don't think that things that are absent are worth our attention. The things that are present, you know, if somebody gets the virus, it's present, and I respond to it. But how do I respond if I don't have it, and I'm still quarantined, and I'm still isolated from people, let alone isolated even within myself, which is just, that's a whole other kind of can of worms. So, I mean, I think I think that's kind of to me what I'm seeing is is that's kind of what gets in our way is how we've defined what grief looks like. And how we have connected it only to certain areas or things or events. And then when we start talking about a future, which is undefined, um, to, to connection, you know, I, <laughs> I had one student say to me yesterday, I haven't had human interaction for 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that. And, yeah. and it's like, holy cow, what do I do with that? So. I think there's uh, there there are there's a lot in this landscape to take advantage of. Uh, I, I mean, I the the and that's that's the hard part 
is that I, I, I heard a lot of people, myself included, it's like, I'm just in survival mode. I'm trying to get through the next 24 hours and figure out what they are and when they start and when they end. And that's it. And <clears throat> so, you know, how do I lean into this thing, if, if you will, and pay attention to the emotions and stuff that I'm having, even though they get really inconvenient and they <clears throat> interfere with our functioning and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. going a back long to answer little to things. a very short question. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> going back to the little things, just to kind of normalize it for people that mm. feel like they're they're just upset about losing things that aren't, they feel aren't as important um, as losing a, yeah. a spouse or a child or their job. What are some examples that you can give or yeah, that you've heard I, from I your think, students? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the enemy, if you want to put it that way, the enemy to um, allowing us to, to be human, and that includes the emotions we have, but the enemy to that is comparison. And in a lot of cases, you know, I, I say there are kind of three C's around this thing called grief and, and the, the losses that we've experienced and so forth. And probably the first one is this comparison point. It's like, well, I, I haven't lost anybody to death. So what am I complaining about? Or, you know, I, I, I still have my friends and I still can see them. So, and, and, and the answer is always the same, is, is uh, we're trying to shut down and contain, there's the other C, contain the emotions that I have, um, and then finally control, and, and how do I control what I'm feeling, what I'm doing, because I've got work to do, I can't wait, blah, you know, all of that. And so, but I, I would probably under, underline more importantly than anything, the kind of comparison thing, because it, it you know, I, we, we see, you have a lot of people that, that literally describe, and I've talked to a variety of people, including the people in my household, who describe kind of emotional devastation and the destruction, and then they end it with, but everything's fine. <laughs> but everything's great. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> and, and my response, yeah, my response usually is, you don't have to put a bow on it. It doesn't make, you know, you put a bow on a pig, it doesn't make it any less of a pig. <laughs> and that same thing is true with, with what we're talking about here is you can't make, you can't make this a good thing because it isn't. It's, it's isolating people and people that have gone into this already isolated. It just makes it even more profound. And so, you know, in a sense, let's call it for what it is. And then use that motivation to move toward people, even even this kind of interaction. It's not, as we were talking, you know, off air, it's not, I, I don't have the, the, the power of somebody's presence in, in this interaction. I can, I, I get all the same inputs. I get visual, I get, you know, uh, minor, uh, minor cues, social cues and things like that. But I don't get presence with, through a screen. I just can't. Because you're there and I'm here. And when you're there, I'm not. And so the, the presence piece, I think we probably need to learn a little bit more about how important that is and, and use that. I, I know My Quiet Cave has been doing these online groups and they're a reasonable stand in, but the one thing that's missing is the social context and personal presence. And people will say, yeah, that's helpful but I felt all of these emotions and where do I go with them? <clears throat> and it's the presence of somebody there with us in that emotion that actually validates it. They don't have to say anything profound. They really don't. I, you know, I, it's something I, <laughs> I say to my students all the time and they're probably going to cringe when they hear me say this, but more often than not, people need our presence more than our profound words. Mm -hmm we underestimate the power of our presence and and you know the 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 uh, <clears throat> hebrew the jewish religion has a tradition around mourning and grief called sitting shiva and we see it portrayed in scripture in in job and job's friends literally sat shiva with him in the midst of tremendous destruction in his life um and for seven days 
And I don't think there's a single American that could get by seven minutes without saying something. It's like seven days. And I, what my response is, is, is <laughs> they did their best work in the seven days. It's when they opened their mouths that it all went downhill. So, yeah, I think, um, I, I think probably the one thing I would point to is the comparison game and how that robs us of experiencing our emotions as they are, finding other people that can say, yep, me too, I'm in, I, I got that. And, and say, well, okay, it doesn't fix anything, but at least I know I'm not alone, so. Yeah, no, that's incredibly powerful, what you said about presence. And I think you're right, that is the difference with the, these online groups or even just talking to you now. Um, because when we're like this or on a telephone call, we want to talk. We want to fill the space because we're not there. And it right. feels awkward if I was just to sit here and stare at you for the next hour. <laughs> What's your child? Please yeah. don't. <laughs> and if I was in the room, you know, when you're in a room with yeah. a good friend, yeah. it's just heartbroken. I think back to my college days, you know, the breakups, you just go over and hang out with a friend yep. and you and you can sit there and not say anything, yep. but it's different when you're on the phone or on a video call. You feel like you need to fill that space right. with more words, which we don't need more yep. words. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I have one, one person say, uh, they call their friend up just to keep them on the phone while they're doing their homework, just to get a little of that. Wow. And then just like, are you still there? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I am. Um, but I, I, it's the lengths we go, which is really quite amazing. I, I think it reflects uh, the profound nature of uh, being made in the image of God is, is the profound lengths we will go just to have even just a thread of connection. And, and that is comforting to us. Now, we may not identify what those emotions are. There may be a, a, a small quieting of the restlessness in our hearts or it may be, <clears throat> I feel a little less troubled um, knowing that somebody is on the other end of the line, if you will. Um, but I think that's worth paying attention because I, I had I had one student ask me this yesterday, and that was, um, so what do you suppose it's going to be like when we get get back to quote quote unquote normal, whatever that is? I mean, um, <clears throat> and you know. How is this going to impact our social relationships? And, you know, the skeptic in me says, eh, it probably won't. I, I, we'll go back. We'll be so relieved to be back to where the way things were before. We so want that, even though we so want that previous state, even though when we were in that previous state, we were complaining like crazy about it. <laughs> but we want to go back to that. And our, I, I think, like I said, with a skeptic in me says, yeah, the relationships are probably just going to go back to the way they were. Or we can learn something about, like I said, kind of the landscape of our own hearts and what, what feelings do. And what feelings do is they drive us toward each other. Now, if we empty our lives of the feelings, what does that mean? Then our interactions with each other is nothing more than information exchange. It, it, wow. it doesn't have the depth to it that the feelings do. And, and, you know, I know a lot of people, whatever number of people are out there, but I, I, I know a lot of people are saying, yeah, yeah, it's a psychologist, it's a counselor, that's all they want to talk about is feelings and blah, blah, blah. And I get that. I do. I think a lot of times when I talk about it, it, it seems like that's all I talk about. But it's because of our overemphasis on scrubbing our lives clean of the things that make us human. And that, I, I, I think we're paying a price and now we're finding out what that price is like now because we didn't build in that into our relationships before. No, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna, speaking of people out there, let me check here. Um, Cause I know one of the things about doing Facebook live is interactions. Let's see if we have any questions. Um, yeah. Uh, Mason says this time is showing us even more how important connection is bringing us back to our roots in a sort of way. Absolutely. Um, yes. Just be there. You can't get presence through a screen. 
Chad says. That's <laughs> very true. Um, so let's go back. Um, so we've talked really about presence and the importance of being there with people. So uh, let me think of how to phrase this. I've seen, um, I've known a few people through, of course, online. I've seen where people have lost loved ones during this time, some to COVID-19, some from other causes. Yeah. And they're yeah. unable, because of the restrictions, they're unable to have memorial services for these people. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what would you say to them or, or to some of us that want, that are having a hard time mourning in the traditional way of having a memorial service? Yeah. Yeah. I, the, the interesting thing about that is it, it's as if it, um, adds another layer of loss because particularly in the area of loss and grief and stuff, we, um, by the way, I, we count on our rituals to give the the a full meaning to what it is and and a memorial service or a funeral service or wake or whatever the word is we're going to use at the time does that for us it kind of marks time for us we set aside that time to connect with people connect with the memories and and the the happy and sad both more happy because we don't like the sad stuff um and and so it it kind of adds meaning that's what rituals are for i mean rituals are for adding meaning they mark time they add, kind of uh add a substance to it and now i can say there i think the challenge that people face now without being able to have that is is this loss of not only the person if they've lost somebody to the virus but then they've lost the actual ritual that helps them transition from the person's presence to the person's absence. And, it, and, and that land that we're in between presence to absence varies. And, and so, um, <clears throat> so, you know, I think, I don't think that that has to dictate to us whether or not we get closure. Now, closure is a very common phrase we tend to use around this thing and uh the with loss and and grief in losing somebody and the problem is, is it's never very well defined you know it's like how do i know when I'm, i have my closure and yeah most of the time ironically it's defined by how it feels to me and so it you know people end up saying well i i'll know it when i have it but if I'm doing all my uh, all my effort, like I mentioned before, to scrub all the emotions away, then I'll never have it if that's how we're going to do this thing. So the idea of closure, I, I think people then have to kind of institute their own rituals to stand in for the the more uh, institutional rituals we have. Whether, like I said, whether it involves the church or whatever that involves, and and that may mean you know, um, writing a letter. Now, obviously, we, we can't send it anywhere. But I, I, I think, again, it's, it's writing a letter. I, one of the, the rituals I instituted from myself, I, my dad died when I was 12, a long time ago. And, um, and I never really said goodbye. I, I was just afraid of saying goodbye. Because if I said goodbye, I figured I'd lose him again. So the least I could do was hang on tightly and hope for the best. And, <clears throat> and that was one of the things that I did is I wrote a letter it, uh, to him telling him, you know, one, I was mad because he left. And, and, and you would say, well, that's fairly irrational. I mean, he didn't plan to die. It doesn't matter. That's not how it felt to me. Um, and then I, I went to the, the, the cemetery and sat by his grave and read it to him. And, was he there? Of course not. He wasn't. But I was there. And, and ultimately, my heart was waiting for me there because I had disconnected from it during that time. And that's what these moments of loss sometimes do, is that they, they separate us and, and we have to find a way to get reconnected. And these rituals kind of help us do that. And uh, writing a letter or listening to music that was part of the, the landscape of the relationship or um, <clears throat> visiting places that, that um, 
that you frequented with the person, things like that. And again, you, somebody said, you know, I, and I, I've heard all the excuses. I've, I've been doing this for way too long. And, and the excuse is, well, why? I'm just, I'm just making myself sad again. Hmm. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I, can, I can relate to I, that. I know. I, I know. It's like, and. Yeah, yeah. The last I checked, I, no one's died of sadness. Hmm. The, the, and and I, I, you know, the, the interesting thing about this is, is that all of our most beloved scripture passages oftentimes are a result of a loss. Because that's the one thing that we can connect with. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you take any of sad stuff out of the Bible, you'd lose whole sections of it, including whole books, like lamentations. <laughs> yeah. The word is lament. And I think cultures that facilitate and encourage um, joy and great you know, celebration and all that, also have to make room for the lament. In order for one to have meaning, we have to have its contrast. And <clears throat> scrubbing ourselves clean of all this other stuff, it works in the short term, but sooner or later, I think the, the, the pent up energy, and I, I just talked about this on, on my podcast last night, is, is it, it leaks into our emotional water table and begins to contaminate the relationships that I have. I may not see it for a long time. I mean, in my case, I didn't see it at all. Of course, I was a young kid for 10 years. And then I then I bumped into it when I started actually doing real grief work around that. And I recognized that, wow, I, I, had, I hadn't crashed and burned, but I had pretty well corroded a lot of my relationships because of my anger and the other things that were part of losing losing a parent so i i think sometimes people have to get a little creative in these times to to institute their own rituals to stand in until such time that they can do a more institutionalized one that the church offers and things like that um it's not the same none of this is the same i mean there's nothing here that's quote unquote normal but i think we can be intentional about moving into that and and helping others you know uh, encouraging others to do the same and encouraging ourselves and giving ourselves the space to do that and, and uh you know for some people that have lost people this social isolation is is like being thrown into the desert with no compass and no map and and so it it's a very lonely proposition i think friends around that person need to make the trek out to the desert and sit for a while with them and when they're ready to walk walk with them at their pace not ours and then we they, we will find community again which is what we are all have been longing for anyway yeah hmm. yeah thoughts on the just being isolated and um not being able to go about our normal rituals but i also started thinking sometimes when we are confined at home we're not around the normal distractions. We're not able to go out and distract ourselves, yeah. right? From feeling what we feel. Yeah. So it might feel worse and harder because we're just stuck oh, yeah. with all of our stuff, <clears throat> right? Yeah. yeah, we have our, I mean, we kind of have our comfort items, you know, or yeah. our favorite distraction items. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm confined to my 10 by 10 office here at, at home. I've got lots of distractions in here. That, that I could I could make a pretty good case that they're good, but they're not what I'm supposed to be doing, which is part of my resistance. Because, and again, it, it, these this is a lot of times this is why I like to talk about grief and loss as much as I do, which doesn't make me morbid or you know a <laughs> Debbie Downer, but because all of our lives are connected to the issues that come out of this, and that that's for good reason because life has a contrast called death and they are connected. They are not disconnected. And if I allow them to be connected, what's interesting and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross says this all the time is we find meaning because if we live like we're going to live forever, then I, easy come, easy go. But I, 
<clears throat> so yeah, I I it, it, I always laugh. I'm having these kind of Zoom meetings with my my students. And and sooner or later, a dog or a cat or something will show up in in the picture, either across. Oh, yeah. the, the, the cats always seem to ha have to make themselves known. I don't know why that is. Um, <clears throat> but th there's something about the, the the person's demeanor that changes when a pet comes in, and why? Because it's a it's a comfort thing, and we look to those things as well. I mean. The, the general pastime of most students is to blow time with Netflix. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed at all. The one thing I hear a lot is, but boy, their motivation has, and it's tanked and they're not sure what to do with it. And the worst part about it is then we, we do this comparison thing, like I was talking about before in a vacuum. I have no information. I'm, I'm not. I'm not in a classroom to compare myself to the student next to me or whatever. Hmm. And I, that that's boy, that's a poisonous situation when I start comparing in the vacuum of my head. And and that's and I will always lose. And we will always hear the voice of shame and what kind of bad person we are and we can't seem to get our crap together and mm -hmm. and all of that and. And then it's, you know, it's death by not, not a thousand cuts, by it, but a thousand sips of this poison. Um, and then, so, you know, somebody comes in or you bump into somebody in the house. And it's like, Arr! <laughs> it's <Yeah>. like <laughs> I'm ready. Let's, let's, let's go around, you know, so. Right. Yeah. Let me check. Um, we keep getting little pings here. For those of you out there, this is my first time doing a, Facebook Live, so bear with us. From what I understand, we have about a 20, 30 second delay too. Yeah. Let's look at all these comments. Any questions? Hold on a second. <clears throat> For some reason, they've all disappeared. If anybody's got questions, <laughs> please go ahead and ask them again. <laughs> the minute we look, they leave. <laughs> I know, I don't know how to how to uh start the comments over it says there's 17 but i can only see a few i apologize mm -hmm. oh <clears throat> yeah we're hearing yeah that it's very helpful hearing that death and life are connected that is helpful mm -hmm. um, any other questions go ahead and post we're on a little bit of a delay i will try and keep up with those uh, <laughs> So it, it, what that means is we have to vamp for 20 seconds just to see if somebody's got a reaction to what I just say, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I hear it. See, the writing letters is great. Um, mm. So why, yeah, going back to why does everything feel worse right now? Mm. Um, maybe we lost a person or, or lost, yeah. um, you know, maybe our marriage ended five or six mm. years ago right? Even the death of a marriage, a death of a relationship. And all of a sudden we just find ourselves, oh, just overwhelmed with all this yeah. stuff we thought we worked through. What is that all about? Yeah. And I, uh, the, the, the metaphor sometimes I use, and, uh, you know, I think yeah, I have to say you, you stretch a metaphor too far, it falls apart. So I'll say that right out of the gate, but uh, the the metaphor sometimes I use is, is it's a little bit like like driving or being on a journey of some sort and you know, the the people that we meet we go on the off ramp and we set up life over there and we always get back on the journey again but it's set up there and then when something happens that separates us from that person and I'll just go with the person idea here right then then essentially you know we kind of um, either we're gonna say all right that's over. I'm going to ban that exit ramp <laughs> and I'm going to keep going. But the problem is, is I can't entirely close that ramp. And so I go down on my, I continue down on my journey. I hit another bump in the road, another loss or something. And the, the, the interesting thing about that is, is that the memories from this past exit ramp seemingly opens wide open and comes forward into where we are now. And, and the one observation I would make is that losses tend to connect because it returns us to a state that we were before. And 
And at least in psychology, we call it state dependent learning is that I learn certain things. I make conclusions around a particular state that I'm in. And then when I return to that state, that stuff comes back again. And so it, the problem I think was what we've got right now is the social isolation is a little bit like amplifying the signal of all of these other losses that maybe I haven't done a lot with. I, I, you know, I, I don't, as we were talking, you know, I, I don't see them as that big of a deal. Let's just keep moving. <clears throat> and, and life can work not that bad doing it that way, but uh, it, those, those things connect up. And then they, the social isolation of this that we're in only turns the volume up and it seems like it just makes it worse because of the other losses. Now that doesn't mean I'm not, you know, I, I, I haven't done any work that I'm not implying that at all. I, okay. Every time I do my grief and loss class and I talk about my dad and the things that I've gone through in my own, tears will still show up. Does it mean that I'm not done? No, it doesn't mean, it just means that I cared about what happened. And, and, our our tears are are probably one of the most profound sources of communication we have because I don't need to use words. T tears all by themselves communicate something without me ever using words, and it connects up in in the human soul with one another. And so, you know, I we apply logic to it. This doesn't make any sense. This is just a virus. I can hang it out, and this is fine. I'm I'm going to be fine. And while that may be a factual conclusion of the future, that is not a feeling based conclusion of the now. <laughs> and it's that that I need to find a way to connect. And so <clears throat> it makes sense to me because I, I've talked to people doing this. And the funny thing about it is I've been doing counseling for 40 years. And I can't think of a single counseling session, not that I can think of them all, because when you go that far, it's, I'm lucky to remember, like we were talking this morning. Yeah, the day of the week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I think I, I would be pretty safe in saying that um, I have never not talked about loss in any of my counseling sessions, any of them. I. I Somebody comes in with anxiety and I, we start talking about it. And somebody listening from the outside says, well, what does that have to do with loss? Hmm. Well, anxiety is part of loss. It shows up. Why? Because either I'm afraid of what I will lose or I'm feeling anxious over what I've lost. And so there's always a subtext under, um, all of the counseling I've had, and I recognize that in the losses that people experience, and and so it to me, like I said, it 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 makes complete sense for people to say, why is this so much worse? And the simple answer is because losses connect. Right. It puts us back in a state again. And it all floods back in. Yeah. Yep. Makes sense. Let's see here. Um, we've got a long one. Uh, how do you define healthy grief, which we'll do in a minute, because I know you have a lot to say about that. So think, remember that one. Um, how could you speak, Delisa says, how could you speak to the anger of a person, to the anger a person feels during grief? How would you help someone virtually counseling work through this? Speaking to the uh, anger. Hmm. Yeah. A big one too. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, my first reaction is tell them to get Zoom on their phone and let's go for a walk. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a good one. <laughs> get, getting out of the confines. I, <clears throat> I think probably the one emotion that is the toughest for people to tolerate in themselves and in other people is anger. And anger bubbles up from pain. And if we go down deep enough into what that pain is, there's a lot more to it. And, you know, again, I, I think we, we, at least in the Christian community, we've gotten some real mixed messages about anger. Uh, we get this notion that um, 
the anger inherently is sinful and and i i don't buy that i i I think if that's true then we have to apply it to all emotions and and so and also we see examples of jesus getting angry and so okay let's let's kind of take that one off the table now what i do with my anger that's a different story altogether and so helping somebody i mean virtually it's pretty tough to do I, I, I this is most counselors are hamstrung with with this thing because they're accustomed to what we talked about earlier in terms of presence and i read a lot in somebody's posture and and how can you tell that in, in this setting <clears throat> so the posture piece the intonations even because we're you know we're we're tag teaming it here kimberly i mean i i, I clear my throat while you're talking and it, it moves <laughs> over and and we ignore that in all of our social interactions and yet i can't catch as i sit and talk to people i can't catch a a glance of their eyes away from me when i ask a question i can't get that in this and so we again and we've talked about this already we, we kind of blow past some very very subtle social cues that help us to position ourselves with other people now all that to be said what about anger well anger is a necessary part and and this is not going to be good news to a lot of people this anger is a necessary part of our healing when it comes to grief because anger expresses the connection the the love i have because i don't get angry about things i don't care about Mm. (laughs) i mean it's like yeah whatever easy come easy go but you start messing with my kids or messing with things that i really care about you'll end up seeing a very different side of me and 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 so anger is a necessary part of our healing you know if you if you drag it over in the physical realm you know a doctor comes in uh, diagnoses whatever injury you have and and they they do something that annoys all of us and that is they palpate the area they poke and Mm. prod and twist and it's like stop you're making it worse and he's like i can't help you if i don't do that and anger is is i think a natural human response to things not matching what we expected things to be and the way to get it back is to have this anger. Now that doesn't make us childish. I, I, I mean, anger is embedded in lamentations. It's in, embedded in lament as well. So it's a necessary part. So if I'm going to sit with somebody that's angry, I, all my job is, and, and uh, easy way to put this is, is what I what it calls learn the language of the heart or the language of comfort. And that is validating what somebody has. Now, a lot of people will say, well, I don't want to value, validate that. They'll always be angry. No, they won't. Uh, the, the fire burns out eventually. But it, the harder we suppress something, the hotter the fire becomes. Hmm. And so I, I, you know, I, I think the anger piece of this is a necessary component that, we, that is part of the healing process that we will cycle through. I, you and I talked about in the, the you know, that video we shot <clears throat> back in the summer, is that we, we, people are watching themselves cycle through now. We go from numbness mm-hmm. to being really ticked off, to resigned, to apathetic, to I gotta get some stuff done, you know, which is you know another distraction. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and sooner or later, I slow down long enough to to survey that landscape and say, there's some, I I see some growth here, but then I also see this wilderness over here that I've left. And that that's part of that cycle. And and we talked about the the model I like to talk about as a seasonal model and, and people have gone from, well, and even our crazy weather here, we do that is, you know, we go from winter to spring to winter to spring, <laughs> and now today's spring, and 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 then we move into uh, a summer, 
and and we get more activity and we get more energized and then we, then we return to a fall of our grief where it, we we reminisce we have some retrospective about it the the color starts to return to our lives and and that's a natural cycle in the world around us that we're all familiar with but the cycle within us we're not as familiar and, and that's what you call anger, the stop you it, that's your seasons yeah. of grief model that you came up with right. yeah, yeah that you created right right and and that's each one has a, a little bit different landscape i've i'm standing on the shoulders of some great theorists and 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 grief and loss and and um but it, each one has a different landscape just like every season does and each one has different tools that are needed and i i jokingly say you know when when the leaves start falling i don't get my snowblower out you know i get a rake out and you know i when spring comes in the grass i don't you know i don't i don't uh, <clears throat> get a snow shovel to to clear my yard I, I i use a tool that goes with it and and my my kind of um suggestion is is that maybe if we thought of it in seasons we wouldn't be quite so surprised when fall came around it's like you know we go through summer and fall comes it's like how did that happen i don't know where that came from and yet when it comes to states within ourselves we do that all the time right i mean i have people saying i don't know where this is coming from it's like yeah really everything's good everything's great why are all the leaves dying and falling off of me yeah yeah right don't rock the boat for crying out loud yeah yeah exactly yeah. oh so is there a healthy healthy way to grieve how would you define healthy grief within that <laughs> is that too big yeah i mean no well i yes and no i mean i i spend i'm now spending 16 weeks just talking about that but you know i i think um I think if, if if people were to go back through what I've been talking about and what you and I've been talking about, I am describing what health, healthy grief looks like. So th there's a big portion of it that is not suppression. There's a big portion of it that is acceptance. And, and all of the things that are related to the seasons that I've been talking about are really a part of healthy grief. And the fascinating thing about it is, is I, I, I don't have any data to, to back this up other than just my own experience, but it's a little bit like we were designed to grieve because we're designed to love. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, then, if we don't do those things that I mentioned, suppression and denial and containment and all the other things, and even being present with ourselves, which is, again, that's just a whole nother exit ramp, then, then that's healthy grief. I, I think the problem is, is that a lot of people think grief is this very uniform thing that, that, and that's why we like the stages is that, you know, I go through denial and then I go through, uh, you know, bargaining and then I go through detachment and then I, and not really. I, I have not yet met anybody that goes through grief and says, yep, it's pretty linear. I got through denial, mm. got to the end to resolution. We're all good. Very uh, linear. Yeah, rarely. Yeah, very. And, and usually, you know, our, our systems and our emotional systems kind of come back to hijack us. And we say, wait, wait a minute. I thought I had this done. So, um, you know, I, the 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 thing is i think uh, even when i try to answer that is that if i am overly specific <laughs> which i won't be uh, if i'm overly specific people will use that as the measure of where they are and then conclude that they're doing it wrong the only way to figure out how to do healthy grief well is always in relationship <laughs> hmm. always in relationship we would rather have kind of a ladder like approach to it and so when i get to the top of the ladder i'm i'm done but the problem is is and it's not really a problem but our lives are littered with relationships <laughs> so and that's what we're feeling the absence of here mm -hmm. but our lives are littered with relationships and those connect to loss as much as they connect to fullness 
And that's that contrast that, that I was talking about before. Yeah. I have somebody here, Susan asked, how do we help people identify what they're feeling? Maybe what their emotions mm -hmm. are. Um, because that's hard. That's mm -hmm. hard for me to even do. I don't always know what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. I'll start yeah, right. screaming about something and, and cause I, I struggle with anxiety. And so I'll get very mm -hmm. angry. You know, I'm very, mm -hmm. very angry. I'll start screaming. The kids make a noise and it's just, ah, and it all comes out of mm -hmm. me wanting to control. And where does that really come from? So I'm just throwing that out there. I have a hard time too. <laughs> How do we help other people do that? Yeah. And I, you know, I, <laughs> At some level, I could I could hear some of my students screaming, "Oh no, the feeling sheet!" <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you do the the feeling wheel? Because I've used that. Well, it's not the wheel. I give oh, them a okay. whole a whole darn sheet. So, uh -oh. um, and, and they, you know, that sheet is just a sampling. But uh, you know, a lot of times I'll give that to somebody and say, "Look through," mm. and when you find something that kind of says. Oh yeah, that um, I got that one. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the problem with that is, is it separates us from our feelings. But I think really the only way to reconnect with our feelings is to label them. So, a feeling sheet like that, you can find them all over the internet. Um, yeah. Is a way to do that. I, you know, the <clears throat> the standing joke is mad, sad, glad, bad, scad. <laughs> scad, yeah. Yep. Coast <laughs> and. Uh, but the, the problem is, is those anchor kind of pillars and underneath that, there's this whole range from, you know, if I'm mad, I go from irritable to enraged. And in a lot of people, particularly with the anger scale like that, if, if I'm feeling irritable, they'll just lop off the bottom of the scale. They won't talk about anything below it. But when I hit enraged, now I'm really mad. And, and so, I, I I encourage students and other people I've talked to over the years to, like I said, to kind of develop a vocabulary of our emotions because that allows us then to communicate them. And when we communicate them, they become real. As long as things stay locked up in our head, they're not really real. Mm -hmm. And we can just dismiss them. And like I said at the very beginning, <laughs> Uh, when I start dismissing that and go flatline in my emotions, then everything else suffers when, when we go that route. So yeah. let's see, I've got a couple more questions. Let's see. Also, can you talk about teasing out our anticipatory grieving? What will life be like after this while in the process of losing then grieving after a loss has occurred? How are they the same or different experientially? Yeah, I mean, I, that's that's kind of the cycling thing that right. we were talking we're about. Talking you about. Know, I, Elizabeth Kubler Ross makes the makes the assertion in one of her final books called "On Grief and Grieving" um, that anticipatory grief is another beast altogether mm. <clears throat> because it, it's a thing unto itself, and un, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's built on something that hasn't happened yet. Now, you know, if some people are sitting in an ICU with somebody with COVID and it, it hasn't happened yet, but it seems imminent, that, that is a, a different level, I think, of, of pain than the pain once it's finished. And, and a lot of people that go through grieving have a really hard time with the sense of relief they feel around that. Now, some of it is directed toward the person and, and the relief of them not having pain anymore. But particularly, you know, if you really get right down to it, you know, the trips into the hospital yeah. or 24 seven caregiving or any of those things, there's a sense of relief that comes from that. So and not having to worry um, about that phone call that's gonna come, right? Right. 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 So the anticipatory aspects of this is really our exquisite ability to live somewhere that doesn't exist yet. It's called the future. And, and the problem is, is because it hasn't been defined yet, what do we fill it in with? And we fill it in with a lot of the fears and a lot of the insecurities and the other things that we just have normally in everyday life, except that that's all that's, it, that's a part of it. And then that looks pretty bleak. 
and I'm 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 feeling even more so. So I think to some degree, um, being patient with oneself, with the anticipation of what's coming, and bracing ourselves for that, and and you know, in a lot of cases, people will brace themselves and kind of turn off the emotions because I don't, I've got I've got to make decisions, I've got to <clears throat> I've got to be there for other family members or whatever that might be. And so the, that part of it is there's a lot of permission granting, I think, that has to be done to engage it to the degree that I can, not to the degree I should, engage it to the degree that I can. And then if the event actually occurs, and sometimes it doesn't, but if the event actually occurs, then we've got genuine grief to walk through and and this anticipatory grief is very different than genuine grief and because it's it's built on like i said it's built on something that hasn't happened yet in genuine grief it's built on reality and and all the things that i have to go through with that so you know i i the the cycles that we go through we get really really irritated with we really don't want those particularly a lower end of them <laughs> we like good days but bad days eh, I, I i can do without them yeah. but that's part of the cycle i think of just our healing and the the what i call rewriting the story or the narrative of our lives without the person in it and we resist it it's normal. We everybody does. <clears throat> so even when we're in this, in this quarantine and kind of isolation period, you know, anticipating what it looks like on on down the road, whenever things start to reopen, whatever that means. <clears throat> um, I I I don't know. I mean, <laughs> quite honestly, I I I, I the we can. We can traffic in a lot of things that, like I said, haven't happened yet. And that's borrowing trouble from tomorrow. It's a phrase from Jesus. Mm. Today's got enough trouble of its own. That's the rest of the phrase. And boy, is that ever true now. Um, and so, you know, I uh, the, the tolerance and patience with ourselves in terms of cycling through is probably the key, not only in anticipatory grief, but also just genuine grief. Yeah. So. Thank you. So I've got one more question for you. <laughs> We're, we've got so much we've covered. Oh, um, Laura asks, is there ever really an end to grief? Does the pain ever go away? I think I know the answer, but I'll let you do that one. <laughs> yeah, I, the, the, the metaphor, I, I, and I talk about this a lot, even in my book, the Grieving the Loss of Someone You Love, I, I talk about um, kind of the metaphor of a burn wound. <clears throat> in, in it and and a lot of theorists actually refer to grief as kind of a, a psychological or emotional burn wound and and there are a few wounds we get that are more painful i mean i can touch a stove on my pinky and sear some nerves on it and then it wakes up later that night and i'm saying this is you know this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me of course i don't wake up enough to do that but um so what does that mean? If we think of grieving as the active healing part, and that healing um, uh, is allowed to continue and does successfully, then the active healing component is comes to an end. You know, I, whether I get to the end of the sickness or I get to the end of hospitalization or whatever that is. Um, then I move into life, and what am I left with? a scar and and i you know I, I i look at scars on my hands and i can poke on them and press on them and and they don't hurt anymore but they're still there and every time i look at one i've got one on my hand that's what i'm looking at every time i look at one i pretty much remember all the things that went into it and that's not all bad but you know i I, I would go so far as to say that we were never designed to forget <laughs> because that's the basis of all learning is memory. So when we condemn ourselves for the memories that we have, 
it again, it's kind of a package deal. I shut down those memories. I shut down everything. And then how do I learn and, and learn from an event like this? And, and we're, we're going to be all affected. You know, I, 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 um, <clears throat> I commented on when this thing whole started kind of running out and we were told that people were asymptomatic, but still carrying the virus. You know, it was almost like if you paid attention, people were kind of looking at each other kind of slant eyed, like, are you, are you a carrier? Are you going to infect me? And they're looking askance at them. And, and that's, and, and so people become a threat because they're carrying it and I don't want to get it. And I wonder what impact that's going to have down the road because we, yeah. we've kind of, we've kind of had this suspiciousness added in mm -hmm. of that. Now, the funny thing about it is that before all this happened, we were all swimming in a bath of germs all the time. Think if you have kids, you've got walking oh, yeah. little germ factories in your house. So, yeah. so we're swimming in it. We just didn't. We now we're made aware of it, and and so we end up kind of looking at people a little differently. And I, I again, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of wonder what impact that might have on our relationships. How to reestablish trust in each other? Right. Trust that you know you're washing your hands 50 times a day, and just like me, and, you know, mm -hmm. um, those kinds of things. So. Yeah. No, I've been talking with my family back on the Mississippi Gulf Coast because we've had hurricanes. I mean, we have yeah. hurricanes. I'm sure you've heard. And after a devastating hurricane, you know, everybody kind of rallies around each other and they're there for each other. And it's just you see this awesome resiliency. Um, I will brag yeah. on South Mississippi. They're awesome. It's okay. uh, but yep. realizing, you know, we're all kind of in this weird place that's similar mm -hmm. where people are struggling and mm -hmm. suffering, but it's very different because yeah. people almost are seen as the enemy. So we can't really rally around each other. Right. But, right. Uh, but that's another yeah. rabbit hole. I want to go back <laughs> yeah. really quick to what you were talking about yeah. with pain and the grief. And mm -hmm. you said, you know, we'll, we'll always remember. Is remembering the pain we felt part of that? Because I know... I feel like I've healed from, from losing people, mm -hmm. but when I think mm -hmm. of them, I still cry. And you say, you right. still cry about your father from mm -hmm. 30 mm -hmm. plus years ago. Uh, right. Right. So what is that? What's and, the difference in, in feeling a sad emotion when you're talking about them? And then that, that pain um, from right. the one that hasn't healed. Can you just tell me what's the difference? Yeah. And I, I think we can differentiate between the moment versus the, the bigger state if you will. I mean, in the moment as, and, and, you know, inevitably as when I tell that story, I, I'm always sure that I'm going to get through it this time. <laughs> um, but then I get hijacked by it. And, and is it pain that I'm feeling? I'm not sure I put it in the, in the category of pain. It, it's sadness because okay. it's gotten differentiated for myself. And so the enduring kind of state of being being in pain around the loss of somebody i don't think that lasts forever if we do our our grief work and that's really what it is if we do grief work well then healing comes and i can remember it i can be sad i can you know i i can chuckle about some memories i might have from somebody or whatever um and and but that's it, it it's fairly um confined to the moment uh, and that's that's kind of the challenge, right? Because I, I think most of a lot of people, you know, you know, the the one observation I would make is that we 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 end up having a culture that conspires against grieving, because it's really inconvenient and messy and undefined, and you know, all of the all of the other aspects of it that people feel helpless and et cetera. Um, and so because of that, then we've got lots and lots of people that that drop off you know they're grieving after a certain period of time and then another loss occurs and they feel it again and so we've got a lot of kind of unfinished and I wouldn't say business but unfinished work to be done now what that means is is that if I'm willing to do that when the next loss comes along whatever that is and allow it to uh, um help me to do more work on what I didn't get finished before, I, I think that's a good, good thing. 
Uh, so we're not stuck in the past and say, well, it's unresolved and I, you know, I'm stuck with this pain for the rest of my life. No, I'm not sure I buy that. Okay. <clears throat> there may be some re-scrubbing of the wound that has to be done in order to to find out what's truly healed and what what needs needs our attention. So, um, so yeah, I don't I don't think that uh, being in the state of of pain is an enduring thing, um, but we feel it in the moment, and actually we actually invite ourselves to feel it in the moment when we tell the story. Okay. <clears throat> Yep. No, I think that's that's great news for a lot of people probably I'm watching. Sure. That's very hopeful. <laughs> so thank you. Well, we've been talking for an hour now. Um, Holy cow. That went by really fast, didn't it? <laughs> Where'd the time go? Yeah, right. I know. Thank you so much. Um, I will oh, you're end. welcome. I'm about to end the Facebook Live, and I'll stick on with you for a second to ask some questions. Okay. But um, for everybody watching as a resource, they can visit your website. You've got some great stuff yeah. on there um, and they can buy your book. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, the website is drmitch.com. Uh, the Mitch is spelled M-I-T-S-C-H. There's an S in there. A lot of people will forget that. I'll put it in the um, comments. And yeah, there's a, yeah there's, a, there's a lot of resources there. Most of it is, is, is for students and so forth. The people are welcome to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> so, and under, under the, the CCU tab, there's, there's the beginnings of a, um, podcast that I'm doing that I just started doing. So there's only a couple episodes in there so far, and it's done by a very amateurish production engineer, me. So, um, but there's that. And then, um, the book itself, Grieving the Loss of Someone You Love is on Amazon, any of the outlets, they they added an audio book. Uh, my publisher did as well, um, and uh, obviously you can get it in Kindle as well and Amazon. So um, there's that, and then the other one is just my YouTube channel. That's under my name, Ray Mitch, and um, I've been putting up uh, my lectures from the grief and loss class. And so, oh, awesome! Um, if people are interested and they want to take a look at them, uh, it's a class. Okay, it's not not any inspiring kind of <laughs> of sermon at all. Although I have one student refer to my lectures as sermons, but um, but that that resource is there too. So those are probably the main targets. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Mitch. I appreciate yeah. you talking with us. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely.